Well, folks, as we get closer to WrestleMania 38 in Dallas, Texas, time to look at yet another classic WrestleMania from the past. This one's very near and dear to my heart because it's the first WrestleMania I ever watched as a new fan growing up in the Attitude Era. And unfortunately, the fact that it was the first one I watched is the only reason it's near and dear to my heart. It's WrestleMania 15 from March 28th, 1999 at the First Union Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And hey, a sub three hour WrestleMania, always good in my book when we're viewing these things. And by the way, what's the tagline for this year's show? The Rage and Climax, which is a very odd pairing of words. Speaking of the Rage and Climax, if you want to watch my classic video about the WrestleMania Rage Party, why don't you click right here. 20,276 folks are in attendance, 800,000 pay-per-view buys for this bad boy. Philadelphia's own Boys to Men sing America the Beautiful. We get the opening package narrated by Freddie Blassie about time and mortality and moments and sacrifice and gods. It's very dramatic and does give Mania a lot more pomp and respect. I remember there being here at this time. Michael Cole and Jerry Lawler at ringside for commentary here. And all we go to our first matchup for the Hardcore Championship, the first time that belt was defended at WrestleMania, as badass Billy Gunn defends against Al Snow and Hardcore Holly. This match is one of the two end results to a big switcheroo or swerve that happened only weeks before WrestleMania. Now, in the weeks leading up to this show, you had Billy Gunn challenging for the Intercontinental Championship and the Road Dog for the Hardcore Championship. But two weeks earlier on an episode of Heat, you saw Val Venus and Bob Holly beat the Outlaws in kind of an upset situation, and so they challenge for the next night on Raw. Hey, Road Dog's going to challenge for the Intercontinental Belt, and hey, Billy Gunn's going to challenge for the Hardcore Belt, and they each won those championships. Uh, and there's no explanation really given besides that as to why they made the switcheroo. Uh, when I met Bruce Pritchard a few years ago in LA to open for his live show, I even asked him, hey, why was that decision made? It was something that was always gnawing at me growing up as a fan. Even he didn't have an answer for it. Oh well. All three men going after each other. The action spills outside quickly. Snow throwing Billy into the steps and he goes flying. Holly with a big suplex on the floor. Al gets out a hockey stick and wails on Hardcore and Billy. A let's go Flyers chant in Philadelphia. Oh no, not King's Gatorade. More trading of weapon shots like hockey sticks and brooms. Snow's on the rampage with a broken hockey stick. A nice Sambu-esque attack off the chair and into the corner by Snow. He's not done yet though. He clocks both his opponents with head. Then he grabs a table. It gets set up, but Billy dinks Bob with the chair, then throws Snow into the table, hits the Famouser on Al, but Holly hits him in the back with the chair. Now he covers Snow and wins to regain the Hardcore Championship. I give this one one and a half stars out of five. This was kind of a short-ish match with just a lot of weapon shots, and that was pretty much it. There was a lot of sizzle, not a lot of stake in this thing. Al Snow is my MVP for this match because he did his best to keep things entertaining throughout here. And Billy, you know, he said in interviews, and I kind of echo the sentiment here, fish out of water is the best way to describe Billy Gunn because he was so, like, dead set and locked in the IC title scene. Made no sense for him to be a hardcore wrestler. He's admitted it wasn't his style, didn't feel comfortable doing it, and so that kind of shows here in this matchup. It might have been a lot better. Well, it might have. It would have, it would have been a lot better if Road Dog stayed in this picture. The Tag Team Championships on the lineup next as Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart, who are accompanied by Deborah, defend against the very makeshift team of D'Lo, Brown, and Test. Now, earlier in the night on Heat, there was a big battle royal to determine who would challenge Jarrett and Hart for the belts. The last two people in the match would become the challengers. D'Lo makes a lot of sense because for weeks leading up to this, he's been gunning after Hart and Jarrett specifically after the feud they had that we saw of some of at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which also saw Mark Henry get written off with an injury. So it makes sense for D'Lo to be in this spot because he's pursuing the tag team champions, but why did he have to luck his way into the match with this battle royal, let alone with somebody he has zero storyline involvement with? It just felt very, you know, random is a good way to describe it. D'Lo's pal Ivory sporting a bandage on her face after she got burned by Terry's lit cigar last week. Last we saw Owen on this channel, he was the blue blazer fighting Mr. Perfect at Mania 5, there is a noticeable lack of chemistry between Test and D'Lo. It's a big story here. D'Lo is distracted by Jarrett, which allows Owen to take over for a bit. D'Lo comes back, fighting the champs by himself. He's a one-man wrecking crew. Deborah gets up on the apron, and Ivory yoinks her down. They're arguing on the outside, which has the referee distracted. PMS shows up for some reason to argue with Ivory. Test arguing with all of them now. Meanwhile, Jarrett and Owen double-team D'Lo to pick up the win and retain. Ivory and D'Lo both get in Test's face, and now Test and D'Lo brawl. WrestleMania, baby! This one gets one star out of five for me. You know, it was painfully short. There was no heat to it. 
it and the story going into it didn't make sense. I mean, I get wanting to put Test in a spot at WrestleMania because he's part of the corporation. He's an up and coming star. He's going to get his spot later in this show. But for him to have been in this match and be involved made no sense from a storyline standpoint. What? Wow, what a great showing for your tag team champions. The biggest show of the year. We see Isaac Hayes, the voice of Chef at ringside. And there's the Mean Street Posse, Shane's childhood friends from the Mean Streets of Greenwich, Connecticut. We'll be seeing those guys a bit later. Up next, oh God, why? Why are we watching this? Do we have to? Do I have to watch? I guess for the for the sake of for the sake of preserving the history, I guess we gotta talk about this. It's the Brawl for All match as Michael Barton takes on Butterbean. Poor, poor Bart Gunn. He was the winner of the previous year's Brawl for All tournament. The lamb being led to slaughter here against the legitimate tough man fighter Butterbean, who has this raw, destructive knockout power. Butterbean made a, a point to say that the no takedowns were allowed in this fight. So the things that Bart Gunn could have relied on in the original Brawl for all tournament would not help him here. The ringside judges for this fight are Kevin Rooney, Chuck Wepner, and the legendary Gorilla Monsoon, his last appearance before his passing later that year at the age of 62. The fight begins, and what else do you want me to say, folks? Butterbean knocks Bart Gunn the fuck out, and that's it. Zero stars for me from this one. Poor, poor Bart Gunn. Then the famous San Diego Chicken shows up in Philadelphia. Sure, that makes sense. He mocks the referee, Vinny Pazienza, and taunts him, so he gets knocked out for his efforts. As Heat wrapped up earlier in the night, Big Show and Mankind brawled in the back. Now we go backstage to see Kevin Kelly interviewing Mankind, who says he's done everything he's been asked to, and now he has one more hurdle in front of him. Says Big Show's about to encounter an angry young man. And we go to that match now, Mankind taking on the Big Show, Paul White, where the winner becomes the special guest referee for the main event later in the evening, which is a very unnecessary gimmick for the angle, quite frankly. More on that later. So Paul White, the former giant in WCW, debuted at the end of St. Valentine's Day Massacre and inadvertently cost his boss the cage match against Steve Austin. The next night on Raw, he makes up for it by choke slamming Mankind off a ladder, helping The Rock regain the WWF title. Foley really wants to stay involved in the main event by offering to be the guest referee. Vince makes him beat The Undertaker, then Stone Cold for the spot, then Vince makes him wrestle Paul White at Mania to finally earn the job. And boy, Paul White has not been booked very well since debuting for the company. I mean, all the extra nicknames they tried to tack on to him aside, like the big top and the big nasty before eventually settling on the big show but just the stuff he's been doing has been completely stupid because first thing he does he costs Vincent Mann the match against Steve Austin then he repeatedly hits the wrong people he gets outsmarted he loses to Austin after one stunner and looks like a total chump overall wow a real strong way to debut this major acquisition the match starts out with a brawl fighting on the outside fully trying to chop down the oak tree but gets pushed back into the steel steps white taking over for a while some clubbing blows goes for a clothesline but fully ducks and white falls to the outside out comes mr Sacco, and it's the mandible claw mankind fights to keep the hold locked in but show keeps batting him away show is fading and mankind gets on top of him and eventually show gets up falls backward and flattens him i can't imagine how it must have felt for fully to take that kind of impact from paul white show now beating mankind with a chair repeatedly in full view of the referee who's just letting us all go for some reason and the announcers go if he's not careful he's going to be dq'd like how's he not already show sets up a couple of chairs in the ring, choke slams Mankind onto them, then the referee finally has had enough and disqualifies White, and Mankind wins, meaning he's going to be the referee in this match. An angry Mr. McMahon makes his way to the ring and chews out Sho for losing the match. Sho picks him up for a choke slam and puts him down. Vince gets in Big Show's face over it, slaps him, and White hits the knockout punch. And so brings us the first of many face and heel turns for the Big Show. I'm going to give it one and a half stars out of five. You know, Mankind generally has had some pretty good chemistry with the giants he's fought in this company, like Undertaker and Kane, for example. But at this point, it's not so with Paul White, who's still kind of learning the style. He seems pretty gassed early in this match. I think it's kind of clashed in this one, and it just wasn't a great match. The finish was kind of flat, and it's all building up to this part of a main event angle that detracts from the rest of the main event angle. A four-way elimination match for the Intercontinental Championship as the new champion the road dog takes on Val Venus, Ken Shamrock, and Gold Dust. As I mentioned earlier, there was the great outlaw switcheroo from two weeks earlier where Billy Gunn went after the hardcore title, Road Dog went after the IC title. So now we have these matches set up where there's no chemistry between the champion and the challengers because they're not who they were feuding with in the first place. Meanwhile, Gold Dust has now aligned himself with the Blue Meanie after beating him at St. Valentine's Day Massacre and Ryan Shamrock, Ken's sister and Val's former girlfriend. Also, Meanie's calling Gold Dust his mother. 
mother now. Meanie was jealous of Ryan's presence in the picture and even called her out to a fight the week before on Raw. The match starts off with Shamrock and Road Dog. The dog very strike heavy, but a nice drop kick as well. He tags in Gold Dust. Val tags himself in. The commentary, meanwhile, does nothing to mention the history between Val Venus and Gold Dust. I mean, hey, speaking of someone who like started watching wrestling right when that storyline was happening, which begat the return of Gold Dust from his evangelical Dustin Runnels gimmick, like to me that was pretty huge. And I think the commentary dropped the ball by not mentioning it. Nice top rope bulldog by Val hits a fisherman suplex, but Gold Dust kicks out. Then we get the old head into the dick spot. They both get laid out by the non-legal men. Everyone's back up. Val with an intense corner clothesline on the road dog. Dog with some jabs to Val, then to Gold Dust, then the old wobbly knee drop. Shamrock tags himself in, gets the ankle lock on Val, and there's a rope break. So when are we going to get some of these eliminations? Ken's dumped out of the ring. Ryan goes to berate him at ringside. Val goes out with him, and they brawl. Ken and Val are both counted out, and we're down to Road Dog and Gold Dust. Shamrock snaps and beats up both men for a bit before he leaves. Gold Dust hits the ropes, but Ryan Shamrock trips him up. Gold Dust goes for a power slam, but Road Dog counters it into a roll-up to win and retain. The Blue Meanie is justified in his hatred and jealousy of Ryan. He and Gold Dust get in her face and tell her to kick rocks. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars out of five. It is one of the better matches overall on this show. But again, I think the fact that Billy Gunn was taken out of this picture and Road Dog put in really hurts it overall because of the storytelling that I mentioned. The fact that like there was no reason for all these guys to fight except, well, they've switched places and now Road Dog's the champion. So make it work. Outside the building, by the orders of Mr. McMahon, the Big Show's getting arrested. He calls one of the cops Bob Newhart and he's put in a regular ass car. In our next match, the Big Red Machine Kane takes on DX's Triple H. Kane and China have been a thorn in DX's side since China betrayed Degeneration X, joining the corporation. China and Kane do have some sort of a relationship now, it seems. Like, China's got Kane under her control. He's very subservient to her, kind of follows her lead, basically. Three weeks ago, Kane went to shoot a fireball at Triple H, but he hit China by mistake. Then on the go home raw, a very obviously disguised Triple H comes out as gold dust and shoots Kane in the face with a damn flamethrower. I mean, how could you not tell that wasn't Dustin Rhodes? Look at him. Kane makes his way to the ring when the San Diego chicken returns and is on the attack. Kane stops him, he unmasks him, and it's Pete Rose who got beat up at last year's WrestleMania, so he gets beaten up again. Lawler says, there's always next year. Yes, there is, Jerry. Yes, there is. Triple H enters through the crowd and jumps Kane from behind. The match begins. Fighting goes to the outside. Kane misses a clothesline and bats the ring post. Gets thrown into the stairs. Triple H is hurt but keeps the fight going. He gets goozled and Kane drops him crotch first onto the barricade into the Mean Street Posse. There's Rodney, Pete Gas, Willie Green, and some other guys who didn't last past this pay-per-view. Kane beating the hell out of Triple H at this point. H showing signs of life but Kane keeps cutting him down. Kane throws H out of the ring then dives over the top to the outside. Damn. Goes up top, but Triple H pulls him down. Kane going for an attack in the corner. I love the noise he makes here. Oh, no. No. Triple H starts coming back, hitting the big knees. Out comes China, who we have not seen since the fireball incident. Kane fights out of a pedigree attempt as China picks up some steel steps and brings him into the ring. Kane's got the steps, and H kicks him into his face. A drop toehold into the stairs. On the outside, another pedigree attempt on the stairs is blocked. Big back body drop. Kane hits the choke slam in the ring. Then China comes in with a chair. She seems to want a piece as well, but it's a betrayal. China hits Kane, and the match ends in a disqualification. Triple H blasts Kane with the chair. A pedigree on the chair, then H and China embrace. China seems to have turned her back on the corporation, and DX is whole again. I'm gonna give it two stars out of five. I think the match went a little too long for its own good. It was kind of boring. For a match with such like personal animosity to it, I didn't really see that play out in this match till the end. And did we really need another disqualification finish on this show? What is this? An even older WrestleMania? Kevin Kelly backstage wondering who's going to be the special guest referee because the big show's arrested, Mankind's in the hospital, then Mr. McMahon says he'll be the guest referee. Up next, a match for the Women's Championship as Sable defends against Tori, not to be confused with Tori Wilson. Sable is a heel now. She's let the success of her appearance in Playboy magazine go to her head, according to Storyline, so she's very aloof and very above it all and very kind of looks down on everyone who's a fan of hers, including the Sable superfan Tori, who's been following her to shows around the country. She eventually gets brought to the ring and is insulted and berated by Sable for being a fan. Luna's dusted off for a whole two weeks to show up and defend Tori's honor, only for Tori.
story to turn on her for Sable, who still rebukes her. Luna was apparently considered to be Sable's planned opponent for WrestleMania this year, but was suspended indefinitely around this time for having allegedly multiple com uh, confrontations with people backstage. And let's talk for a second about Tori's terrible acting. You thought Sable was awful on the microphone? Brother, you ain't seen nothing yet until you've heard the supposedly valiant babyface going against her former idol in a promo. I refuse to stand in your shadow for one moment longer. Sable asks the boys in the crowd if they're ready for the grind. Tori makes her entrance with the deer in the headlights look. We get a two second recap of what happened on Monday before the match begins. Sable on the attack, hitting those kicks and dumping Tori out of the ring. They build her up as totally inexperienced despite the fact that she's actually wrestled in Japan. Tori starts fighting back, some slams on the apron, big dive off the apron and onto the floor by Sable and she's still on the attack. Does a grind but Tori's back on top. Tori with some corner clotheslines, rolls Sable up and gets a two count. They don't have great chemistry in this series of roll-ups, and here's what this match needs, a ref bump. Sable goes for her bomb, but it's badly countered. Then in comes Nicole Bass. Bass, who became famous for her appearances on the Howard Stern Show, no wonder Vince Russo liked her, press slams and drops Tori a whole lot clearer than the Warrior did to Bobby Heenan, which therefore makes her a better worker than the Ultimate Warrior. Sable hits her bomb after the second attempt and pins and wins. Talk about a match that did not belong on WrestleMania for really any reason in the build or the execution. I was shocked to see Tori do so badly in this thing. She's supposed to be the veteran here. Sable looked better by comparison, and she's the one who didn't want to wrestle and wasn't as trained to wrestle as Terry Powers was. She's the one who went to All Japan and wrestled the Joshis. What happened here? Up next for the European title, Shane McMahon defense against X-Pac of D-Generation X, and boy, what a difference 23 years makes if you're Shane McMahon. A few weeks after St. Valentine's Day Massacre, Shane McMahon did the unthinkable and due to a lot of chicanery, beat X-Pac for the European Championship. So this match has become kind of a battle of like uh, upper class versus lower class because X-Pac grew up on the streets. And this was the debut or the beginning of what we know as the Mean Street Posse because in the build for this, we'd see a lot of these vignettes of Shane's old childhood friends like Rodney and Pete Gass and Willie Green talk up how much of a badass and how, how tough they were and how tough Shane was growing up. He was the leader of the gang, always raring for a scrap and everything. It was actually some amazing character work and great heel heat for Shane at this point. We get a pre-match promo from DX backstage. Triple H still breathing heavy despite the match happening like 10 minutes ago. Shane is accompanied by Test. The Stooges, Patterson and Briscoe jump X-Pac during his entrance, but he shrugs them off fairly easily. Shane does a leapfrog and is pretty proud of himself, but then he eats a kick. Test helps Shane avoid a Bronco Buster, then moments later beats up X-Pac on the outside. Shane on the offense with some knees and a slam, goes for The Rock's corporate elbow, but X-Pac moves. Shane grabs Test's belt and uses it to whip X-Pac until Pac launches him out of the ring. Back on the outside, the posse grabs X-Pac, but he takes all them out. Another clothesline by Test. Shane goes to the corner, but he gets crotched and takes a superplex. Test yoinks X-Pac out of the ring during the pin. X-Pac dodges him. Now it's his turn to whip Shane with the belt. I love Jerry's call here. We need a miracle to win this, and you won't let me pray. Bronco Buster by Pac, and another cheap shot by Test, this time with the title. The crawl, the cover, the kick out. Shane goes for his own Buster, but he misses. Test gets involved for the 80th time, and he gets a Bronco Buster for his efforts. Finally, Triple H and China show up as Pac hits the X Factor. China on the apron. Triple H with the betrayal and hits the pedigree on X Pac, his former friend. Helps Shane get on top. The cover, the win. Shane McMahon retains and Triple H has joined the corporation. The beating continues on X Pac and the Outlaws until Kane appears and chases the baddies off. Not too long before we get that sweet, sweet Kane and X Pac tandem. I'm going to give this one two and a half stars out of five. Now, on the one hand, I hated hated all the interference and all the spots from Test and everything and the weapons and everything going unadmonished by the referee. Very similar vibes to the Foley Big Show match from earlier in the night, but it was still a very good story. The, the, the word is, you know, Dr. Tom Pritchard really helped train Shane extensively for this match to make him look good. He, I mean, his training and X-Pac in the ring with him made it about as smooth a match as it could possibly be. Shane was very well protected, but in the spots he did do, I think he looked fine. I think that it was very shocking that twist at the end. You know, as a 
as a kid watching it really threw me for a loop. I assumed, you know, they weren't going to break up DX this early into the run. They were about a year into the current incarnation of DX, and it was still pretty over. So for them to kind of pull the trigger on Triple H and China betraying and going away from DX and being part of the corporation was a pretty uh, bold move. But hey, it worked for Triple H because that was the beginning of the heel turn that would launch him into the main event scene later that year. Now, as for the European Championship, shortly after Mania, Shane would announce he was retiring the belt because he had nothing else to prove, so the belt would be temporarily on the shelf. And we would see more of Rodney and Pete Gass, the official members of the Mean Street Posse, going forward as they became more like trained to wrestle and everything. And th theirs is a real feel-good story in wrestling. If you haven't read Pete Gass's book about like his life and his career in wrestling and how he and Rodney came up through the Federation, it's worth a read. Go check it out. It's time for Heck in a Sec as The Undertaker takes on The Big Boss Man. So this is probably the peak of the Ministry Undertaker era because this is right before the higher power gets revealed and everything goes to shit. So let's see how this builds up because Taker and the Ministry are terrorizing Mr. McMahon at this point. You know, he's, uh, he's threatening to take over the World Wrestling Federation and to control everyone's souls. He promises that she too will be mine, but that's never really implied yet as to who she is supposed to be. Someone very close to Mr. McMahon is all we really know. We see Undertaker like set this old teddy bear on fire and it makes Vincent Mann come down to his knees. Uh, also refers again to that higher power, which we have not found out who that is yet in the story. But of course, we will see what happens in the future with that. And so Vince, as payback to Undertaker for all the torture that he's been put through, is to put the corporation's head of security, the boss man, against him in heck in a sec. Now, I have ripped Ministry Taker on this channel for a while, but I have to admit, watching this build back on Raw every week, removing the added context of what's to come in the future, this is some really captivating stuff here. Like, to see the top heel in the company be kind of, like, owned in a way by The Undertaker was kind of unheard of. It was, it was very, very much disruptive in that way, and it was, it was fascinating to watch again. My favorite part of this build is the episode where the Ministry is, like, stalking the outside of Vincent Mann's house, and Vince is in California, can't do anything about it, so he implores for the corporation member Kane to go speak to Taker and figure it out, but psych! Kane unmasks and it's Taker in disguise. That was such a cool move. Also, it's kind of bizarre watching these episodes of Raw back and seeing what it's building up to and realizing, holy crap, we are nearing the end of the pre-Stephanie McMahon era in the WWF, like before she becomes a character and everything else that goes along with it. And it's, you know, as someone who's been a fan since 98, Stephanie has been part of programming for me as a fan a lot longer than she's not been. And so to kind of go back and see, oh, this is what it was like just before that all changed is pretty surreal to watch, actually. Oh shit, the Ministry theme actually plays for Taker here. It's weird because on Peacock, his theme is usually dubbed to like an older, pre like dark side, pre-98 version of his theme. And my theory as to why they did that was because like the lyrics are, except the Lord of Darkness as your savior, which like, mm, you know, some people might take offense to that. So I get why they would change it. But the fact that it's untouched on the pay-per-view itself, I thought was interesting. Is that some kind of oversight maybe? Some brawling to start things off. Back and forth until Taker starts slamming Bossman into the cage wall. Bossman grabs some handcuffs, cuffs Taker to the wall and grabs his nightstick, gets a few shots in, and the handcuff chain breaks. Welp, Taker's bleeding now, but he fights back on Bossman, hurls him into the cell wall, and it bows out. Taker with a chair now, he gets the swing in. We finally get back in the ring. Taker goes for a tombstone, but Bossman fights out, but the second attempt is true. Bossman gets dropped, and Taker wins. Wow, that match sure was boring, but wait, what What's this? It's the Brood! Edge, Christian, and Gangrel rappel down from the rafters. They break open the top of the cell and drop down a noose. Taker wraps it around Bossman's neck as Edge just kind of floats there for a while. And finally, the cell raises up and Bossman is being hanged. Colon commentary goes, is this symbolic? Like, motherfucker, he's being hanged right now. What symbolism are you talking about? Also, to make it even more insane, the next thing they show here is they transition to the package about the rage party. I'm going to give this one star out of five. This is not a great heck in a sec match or a great WrestleMania match or a great match in general, if I'm being honest. You know, there's a reason, or a few reasons, this match is not really talked about much when you bring up the vaunted history of Hell in a Cell. Uh, the story surrounding the feud with the Ministry and the Corporation is a whole lot more interesting than this match itself, is all I'll say. 
It's now time for the highly anticipated main event for the World Wrestling Federation Championship. The Rock of the Corporation defense against Stone Cold Steve Austin, the first match of the great and historic WrestleMania trilogy. In January, Vince McMahon screwed over Steve Austin to win the Royal Rumble. In February, Austin fought for the right to go to WrestleMania by beating Mr. McMahon in the steel cage at St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And from this point on, to me it feels like the story going into Mania isn't so much like Austin and Rock, or even Austin McMahon. We saw the blow off to that at, say, Valentine's Day Massacre, but it feels more like The Rock and Paul White. Because The Rock is paranoid about Paul White's intentions, thinks he's working with Austin to get his title. White and Mankind are arguing over who's going to be the guest referee for the match. Vincent Mann trying to hold everything together while simultaneously dealing with the Ministry of Darkness. And except for the big beer truck spot on the Go Home Raw, this main event feud surprisingly has Austin in what I perceive to be a third tier position. And Jim Ross is back to call the main event, folks. Ross suffered another bout of Bell's palsy live on pay-per-view overseas back in December and took several months off. He came back angry and bitter that nobody wanted him around anymore because he was ugly, but he just wants to do his job. So he's got his boy, Dr. Death, hanging around with him and fighting his battles. He wants to get back on the show any way he can. So he takes Michael Cole to Dick Kick City. He's got a mini announce table built for him that gets destroyed. He shows up at a frat house party, which feels like a knock on the Nitro parties WCW was pushing at the time. And that ends with an insane brawl with Dr. Death and Hardcore Holly that sees him destroy the frat house. And right away in that brawl, the first thing they do is destroy a fish tank. And all I could think was, oh God, no, the fish, someone picked them up. On the one hand, there are a couple of elements of the story of heel Jim Ross that I actually like here. Like when he has the mini announce table, there's some really funny stuff where he's just trying to talk over Cole and King doing his own commentary and shutting them out, which on the surface is pretty hilarious, but also just feels really insensitive the way they're kind of like building this up as to why Jim Ross is so bitter. They're trying in storyline to, to blame his Bell's palsy partially on the story stress of Dr. Death losing the brawl for all months earlier. Like what? Anyway, he gets what he wants and gets to call this match, which means the heel wins, folks. Special guest referee Mr. McMahon comes out in his best, quote, referee gear. But then out comes Commissioner Shawn Michaels, who we haven't seen in weeks. He tells Vince that the only man who can appoint an official at WrestleMania is the commissioner, that being him. Michaels spoils the finish by barring the corporation from ringside, then adding, well, I might let you come down. Whoops! The Rock wrestling shirtless for the first time in months since having his breast reduction surgery. Look it up. Fists are flying to start this one off. The Rock goes soaring over the top rope and the action spills in and out and back into the crowd. The Rock starts to choke Austin with the camera cable. The match was made a no DQ match earlier in the night, by the way, as if it stopped anyone else. Austin on the attack again. Now he's choking The Rock, throws him into the big WrestleMania sign. Beats pointing to it. Rock with a suplex on the floor, spitting the people's water on Austin, who comes back and drops the elbow on The Rock on the Spanish announce table. Another one breaks it. Austin continuing the assault, finally back in the ring, and The Rock with the him bottom out of no wear in a kick out. Austin grabs a chair from the rock and comes down with it right onto referee Mike Kyoto's head. That allows Rocky to start wailing on Austin's legs with the chair. One to the head, the cover, new referee comes in and Austin kicks out. The rock is frustrated at Tim White's officiating, hits him with the him bottom. Earl Hebner comes in for the count and the rock kicks out. Mr. McMahon returns to ringside to distract Austin that allows rock to regain control. Vince decks the third referee in the match and now he and rock are stomping away. In comes mankind back from hospital and is now the guest ref again. Vince now out of the picture. The third him bottom goes to the corporate elbow, but Austin moves. Austin escapes the bottom once again and hits the stunner. Another big bounce. Austin covers and wins to regain the WWF title. Someone get that man to the bathroom. Austin hits the stunner on Vinnie Mac to wrap things up and send the fans home happy as we fade to black. I give it three and a half stars out of five. This is far and away the best match on the card tonight and really the only reason to go back and watch this show if you want my opinion. That being said, it's not an amazing match. It's certainly not the best in their WrestleMania series for Rock and Austin. It's just mostly brawling and a lot of referee bullshit, which is like a Vince Russo trademark. Of course, he was writing for here at the time, but it's made the match feel tiresome in a way because the story wasn't about Rock and Austin. The whole build to this and the match itself was all about the referees the referees, the referees, and that just took away from the, the, the moment of Austin getting the belt back against The Rock, in my opinion, because that was supposed to be one big, like, mm, one big shot against the corporation, and I don't know, like, it, on the surface, like, yeah, Austin winning did that, but I also feel there was so much shit bogging it down with all this referee talk that it distracted from the main issue. My grade for WrestleMania 15, the rage and climax, is a D+. Uh, this show is often 
considered by many to be a glorified episode of Raw. That's kind of the, the general stance that people have on this thing. And after watching it again for this review, I kind of have to echo those sentiments. This show has a lot of things that are very half-baked, not only in the concept, but in the build and the execution. A lot of things aren't really fully resolved on this show. I feel like that kind of thing can work for television when you have every week to kind of like change and that sort of thing. But I don't think it flies for WrestleMania. Like if we're comparing it to other WrestleManias, this is not a good WrestleMania. It's like a so-so regular non-mania pay-per-view, a so-so episode of TV, not for WrestleMania. But for now, we leave the Attitude Era in the dust and once again jump 10 years into the future to another WrestleMania that many say was another one-match show. We go to WrestleMania 25 in two weeks. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Well, I'll tell well, you so one thing, the, the, uh, man, this match can certainly have a huge impact on WrestleMania well, tonight, 13 man, days from now. Will you be quiet so I can do my work here? 13 days of WrestleMania.